Um, we're talking now to Erin Lewis Fitzgerald, who's in Melbourne, Australia. Um, so, Erin, how are you feeling and coping at this time of you know, lockdown and with um, the coronavirus pandemic? I had all these fantasies about how this time was going to go because I'm the type of person who loves a blackout and loves like chaos, I guess, but kind of like controlled chaos. So I love it when there's major strange things happening. And I'm also a closet introvert. And so I love being home and I love crafty activities and all of that, but I have never been busy, busier since this happened. Um, and I have been working every single weekend since it hit. So it's kind of the opposite of what I imagined. And I hear all these other people's stories of how, the, what they're doing during this time. And I'm like, I just want to nap. I just want to sleep. Yeah. So that would be really because you've um, published your book, Modern Mending. Is that what's created a big flurry? That's a big part of it. Yeah. So, um, so there's, the book came out in March. Or no, sorry, the book came out in February. So I got in just exactly one month before all of this happened. Um, and I know friends who published mending books in March and they missed, you know, like it was just one month later and it would have been the wrong time. But um, because I already got that head start, it's there's been a huge interest in mending. So definitely people are interested in my book. Um, but also I started an online shop called modernmending.com and um, it was an idea that I had because I used to hate shopping for mending supplies. So every time I taught a workshop, I would have to go to multiple places to get the stuff that I needed for students. And I had a particular place that I worked for that demanded individual receipts each time I taught a class, so I couldn't buy in bulk. And it was just very frustrating and very time consuming. Um, so I had this fantasy of buying stuff in bulk and just having it in my house and not having to go shopping anymore. And then when I got my book contract, I had this idea and I thought, oh, wouldn't it be smart if I did that before the book came out? Well, that's like, the, you know, then the two things can kind of go hand in hand. So I wrote the shop into the book before I had made the shop. <laughs> So it says, you should go to modernmending.com. It's great. It's got all my favorite stuff. Um, but I am a former journal and I love a deadline. So uh, it was a good kick up the bum to get that done. But um, yeah, the shop, the shop has been mildly busy ever since I opened it. But since all the media coverage um, and most of the media coverage lately has been spurred on by coronavirus, that's just made the shop go nuts. And so I spent most of my day packing orders or dealing with customers or I had a um, Wednesday last week I spent the entire day contacting wholesale suppliers and saying can you give me a hundred more of everything because <laughs> I ran out and they're, they're like what's happening all our other customers have gone quiet like why are you going crazy and I'm like now's a really good time to mend stuff I don't know mm. so that's great timing isn't it for you great timing in yeah. a way yeah yeah it seems weird because i don't i mean i i don't feel right being happy about it but i'm definitely pinching myself going woo that like i couldn't have planned that better if i wanted to um and a lot of the things that i have done media wise like um i was on television last night but that was filmed six months ago so, you know, a lot of these things were already in the can and the editors maybe said, oh, it's not that interesting or, you know, whatever. But because coronavirus has happened and they're, they all need content and they've got this thing just sitting in this lush pile with me in it, I'm now getting this crazy, like, boom of all these things that would have been, like, normally they would have been eked out more steadily and it wouldn't have been such a big deal. But now it just seems like it's the right time. Mm. So, um, you know, mending is really an important concept for more than just what it is, isn't it? So tell us sort of how you arrived at, you know, being the author of Mending Matters. Modern mending. <laughs> Modern mending, sorry. <laughs> I wish I was the author of Mending Matters. Um, and that is really nice. Yes, I'm sorry. Modern mending. Mm, That's fine. Um, 
So I, like I said, I'm a former journalist and probably mostly worked as an editor, but I also worked as a photojournalist. So I studied photojournalism when I did my master's and photography is very important to me. And I've also been teaching mending workshops for uh, probably six years now, maybe longer. Um, and also teaching people one on one at repair cafes and similar types of events, you know. So it was kind of um, it was kind of a combination of things. But the main thing that spurred me on was that I felt like the book that I wanted to exist did not exist. So I'm a big fan of mending books, and I have a lot of them. And a, a lot of the vintage books are out of date, so they didn't have you know they would teach you how to mend your stockings, but not how to mend jeans and t-shirts or um, I get students with a lot of finely machine knit jumpers in particular, you know, so you're not, it's, you're not necessarily going to Swiss darn or re-knit those items. So um, it was kind of, I felt like there was nothing that I could really refer people to for the kinds of questions I was getting asked. Like the number one question I get asked is about crotch holes in jeans. I see it all the time. And people are always so embarrassed when they ask to. Like they're the first person to ever have that problem when in reality it's like, <laughs> 90% of the population has that problem. Um, so I kind of just thought, well, I've got the skill set to do it. You know, I used to be a magazine editor and I'd written how to articles, like even crafty tutorials for magazines before. And I just thought, well, if none of these other people, and this was so to go back to Katrina, Mending Matters, she had not announced that she was making that book yet. And I thought, well, if Katrina's not going to do it, and nobody, none of these other people that I thought were, you know, like potentially would put out a book. If they weren't doing a mending book, someone has to do it. And it was one of those things where it was like, all right, it's me because I've got the skill set to do it. And then later, you know, once I'd started writing it, then Katrina was like, I've been working on this for six years in secret. So I, I think there were a lot of us who had the same idea at this, you know, around the same time we're secretly going, I should write a mending book because no one else is doing it. So now there's kind of an influx. Um, around the world, but it's fantastic. But I just, yeah, I just felt like um, I wanted something that was like really clear and easy to follow and kind of had a little bit of everything in it. So it wasn't too specific um, and it wasn't too simple, but it also wasn't too scary. But also like um, from a, I don't know if you would call this a lazy perspective, it was like, well, what can I do with the skills I have? So I'm not any good at illustrating, um, there's a mending book that's just come out last month that's illustrations only. I don't have that skill set, but I do have a photography skill set. So it's like, well, I can photograph the things that I've already got. So it was kind of just like, how do I make this pro um, this project happen with the skills that I've got? And yeah, so why do you think mending is arising at this time? Is it just, is it one of those um, self-sufficiency um, skills that um, suddenly we're recognizing are valuable in a modern world? I think it's three things. There's three magic factors that are happening right now. First one is the rise of visible mending. So that started um, probably around 10 years ago. It, it wasn't invented 10 years ago, but it started to gain popularity with social media. So Instagram and Pinterest in particular. Um, and Tom of Holland, uh, coined the hashtag visible mending and that it started off slow, but now it's just, you know, it's huge. Um, I think because invisible mending is very difficult and takes time to build up those skills. And a lot of people now who are starting with nothing, you know, they didn't learn how to sew in school. They're not going to take the time to actually get to that point where they can invisibly mend something. So it's kind of made it more, um, it's made it more contemporary and it's made it more accessible. So that's one. Um, the second factor is the environment. People are starting to care more about the environment and sustainability, especially when it comes to their clothing. So they, they may not have the skills again, but they're thinking about, you know, like the term fast fashion is kind of recent in people's vocabulary. They're starting to go, oh, maybe I do buy too many clothes. Maybe I should do something about, you know, the holes or the rips and things that I've got. Um, and I think the third factor is coronavirus, definitely, because it's a really good project to do if you're stuck at home and you're staring at your wardrobe and you, you're not going to go out shopping, you know? So I don't think 
coronavirus on its own would have necessarily made people mend their clothes, but I think they were already thinking about the first two things, you know, the visible mending and or the environment. And now they're like, okay, well, now I'm stuck here. Now's the time to learn and actually do it. Mm. And I guess perhaps post coronavirus, there might be, um, it might be from a thrifty perspective, you know, people actually having less money and needing to make things go further in their life. Yeah, I think that um, it's interesting, though, because if you I've read a lot of articles that say, for example, when, like during depressions or when there's a recession, that sales of lipstick are really popular, you know, or those little like niceties. So think where you're like, you think, oh, if you're poor or you're struggling, you're just going to buy the essentials, but that's actually not the case. So I suspect we're going to see people wanting to buy new clothes after life kind of as we know it resumes because they're going to get so sick of the stuff that's in their own homes. I just hope it's not too much. I hope we don't completely go back to where we were. But yeah, I do, I do think that income will definitely be a factor, and I'm hoping that at least slows down consumption levels overall. And has the um, crisis elevated your own awareness of, of waste and, and where you get your resources from? Um, I think just a few different things have become obvious to me. I'm pretty far down the waste rabbit hole, so like I'm obsessed with waste and you know um not wasting things and my poor husband like uh, yeah he has to listen to me rattle on all the time but um one of the new things that i've been noticing is because i have an online shop now and i get things from suppliers just noticing how much plastic things come in upstream and and trying to stop that and dealing with my suppliers individually and saying can you please not include plastic and um, things like plastic strapping so, you know, that comes on boxes that get shipped. Um, so thinking about, okay, well, how can I buy more stuff at the same time or kind of calculate like better instead of making more frequent orders and getting more plastic strapping, how can I kind of um, take a bigger gamble and go, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to wait as long as possible and then make less plastic. Or um, like, for example, when I order my book, which I sell, in my shop, making sure that I buy in lots of 18 so they don't include packing peanuts. Because the books come 18 to a box, and if I buy fewer than that, they'll fill the gaps with packing peanuts. So just, I know that other people wouldn't necessarily be thinking about this, but I, I think about it all the time, and it, it makes me realize, like, even though um, the way I present my shop, I'm very clear about all of my environmental policies, and I have a shipping manifesto on the, on the shop site do you know so that people can read about all the things i'm doing but that's they just see what i give them they don't see all the stuff that i'm dealing with and it's it made me think like all those kind of green or sustainable things that we buy or like you know maybe when we go to a shop in person like i'm just thinking of a local shop that's like got an organic grocery you know and i buy things in bulk those things still come in plastic too and we don't see what they get on their end you know so it's um I guess it's made me realize even more that buying less stuff is the way to go, you know, for me as much as for everyone else, just buying less because you, some of it you just can't avoid. Mm, good advice. Um, so in terms of everyday practices, you know, your actions um, at home there, maybe you've been too busy to be doing anything else, but, you know, because you've been busy with your book during lockdown, but, you know, are there other things, um, working with your hands, gardening, that kind of thing that you've stepped up in the isolation period? Opposite, total opposite. We're buying more takeaway because I just, I like, I don't have time anymore. And I have this, um, this little, I'm going to call it my hobby. It's my little happy thing to do. And it's a, I'm going to try to describe it for, but you're not able to see it. It's a magic letter box. And I put dioramas in it. It's got, it's like a shoebox size, it's like a proper letterbox size, um, but it has a clear perspex window in the front and you can put miniature scenes in it. And I'm usually known for doing those like once a month. I haven't changed it since Christmas. So I've still got a Christmas scene. It's, it's May now and I have a Christmas scene still in the letterbox. So it's like the opposite where I'm, I can hear my neighbors out the front door. 
saying, oh, it's still that one, you know, and I feel like I'm letting down the team, I'm letting down the neighborhood. Um, yeah, and again, going back to the fantasies that I had about this time, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm actually going to get through my mending pile. Have I got through my mending pile? I haven't mended anything this year. So um, it's very strange. It's very, I would love, I mean, I could tell you what I would love to be doing if I didn't have all this other stuff to be doing, um, but that's not the reality. Hmm. Well, I think it's good to dream. Tell us what you might be doing when you get a break in time, just to give a concept of what, what you know, your actions might be. Uh, there would definitely be a diorama in the letterbox. And it was going to be a really cute coronavirus-themed one with, like, little miniature monkeys doing Zoom calls. It was going to be so cute. Um, I would definitely be reading more. Heaps of reading. Cooking, definitely baking, but also like batch cooking, making soups and stuff like really nourishing stuff for later. Um, and I would, I would totally be whipping through my mending pile. But also I've had people ask me about mending commissions. And now it's so funny because now I used to feel kind of like I had to be polite. And I just had one last week and the person said, you know, are you interested? And I just said, first up, I am slow. I was like, it's going to take me months to get this back to you. And also I'm not cheap. And she was like, okay, great. <laughs> so, like, so, um, but I have, uh, like, let's just, this is fantasy talk. So yes, I would have finished my own mending pile by now and it would have been amazing. Um, but also I had a bunch of clothes that op shops were setting aside for me for the book and for when I did um, demonstrations in class. So clothes that needed mending, but they didn't belong to me. They were just stuff that the op shops couldn't sell. So I've got bags of those in my house of things that didn't make it into the book or you know that I don't need anymore. And I would love ideally to fix all of those up and then sell them and do a fundraiser for the op shops that supported me by having, you know, the people pick those clothes. I would love to do that. So then I could build my skills, but also give something back. But that's also not happening. <laughs> oh, sorry. We can dream. We can dream. So um, maybe you're not necessarily a great example just at the moment because you're so busy, but I'm just wondering what piece of advice you might, you know, give to people to get through a period such as this where, you know, we're moving through profound change in the way that we live? Um, yeah, well, well, let's have a life as usual, Erin, talk now. Um, I think mending quick things is really good. I love quick wins. Um, and then, you know, like for me, like I knit, but I, I haven't knit anything for a long time because it's such a long-term project. And even though you can see your progress, there's something about finishing that is just, it's amazing boost of confidence and adrenaline, you know? So, so I would say do the things like the buttons or the tiny holes or that stuff you've been putting off, like the hems or whatever, and get those out of the way. And it, then you can, it's a thing that you can take off your to-do list and feel like you accomplished something, you know? But it doesn't have to be this major project that you're like, oh, I don't know if this is ever going to get finished or, um, you know, if it's going to look good. Whereas if you start with the little things and, and get them off your list, then the pile goes down, you get stuff back in your wardrobe. It could even be like stain removal or something, you know, of just like soaking something um, and trying to do that rather than taking on a major project. I guess that gives you a sense of accomplishment, isn't it? Like to have, Definitely. To have, have a feeling about being able to achieve um, increasingly more complex things. But yeah. um, just to finish off on, Erin, I'm just wondering, um, you, you know, put your fantasy hat on now and think about... Um, I love that hat. You know, what, what kind of social, cultural, economic changes you think might um, follow this um, lockdown period because of the pandemic? That's a great question. Um, I know a few people have been saying, you know, imagine the businesses that you want to still exist when all of this is over and support them now because otherwise they might not be around you know they might not be able to make it through that period um i the thing i miss is local shops i really miss walking to places and i really miss um 
having a chat with the person who owns the shop or works there and, you know, being able to get recommendations and having a bit of banter and that kind of personalized, friendly feel. Um, and I think that's even more important. And yes, I know I run an online shop and that seems weird to say, cause you know, online, online shopping is the exact kind of thing that I wouldn't really support unless I had to, but I also feel like, um, I don't know, I guess me being so busy is encouraging for me that people actually want this. They actually want to get mending and they find it difficult too to find these supplies, you know? So it kind of makes me think maybe we could have bricks and mortar mending supply shops, you know, and not just mine, but maybe there could be others, or maybe there could be a dedicated mending section in the craft shop, you know, because right now I know that if I sent someone to go get like, um, mending yarn from Lincraft or Spotlight, for example, like even for me, when I go there, I have to ask where it is because it's always hidden, you know? So maybe it could be something where it's prominent and it's valued and people think, oh, this is a good thing. I want to get these supplies and not make it so hard for everyone. I don't want to be the only one selling this stuff in an easy way, you know? Um, but also I hope that maybe we're starting a trend of becoming more resourceful and going, oh, you know what? Actually, I didn't need that stuff. I can use the things that I have. So like using rags or old clothes at home to patch things or, you know, using whatever kind of string or yarn you've got and making do with that and still making beautiful things and stopping that, um, stopping that process of going, you know, I want things. It's like a cycle, really. So stopping that cycle of, of wanting and needing and realizing going, oh, actually, you know what? I don't. Mm. I don't That's actually really need it. A move to perhaps creating rather than consuming. Yeah, I think realizing that we already have a lot of the stuff we need in our homes right now. Um, we don't need the shiny and new. And then if we do, going, okay, well, if I'm going to buy a new thing, then I'm going to love it forever and be fully aware of like, I guess like a sense of stewardship. I know that's not a sexy word. To me, it is. I love that word. Um, but a sense of, you know, what's going to happen to this thing at the end of its life and looking after it for as long as possible. So... That's what I'd like to see. I love that word too, stewardship. Have you um, got a copy of your book there handy? Or will I grab one from my shelf just to hold up your I have book. one in the other room. Do you want me to go grab it? Um, well, it'll either be you. I've, I've got one over here. I'll just go and grab it. Here it is. <laughs> Just hold it up there. So that's great. Minimise waste and maximise style. So congratulations, Erin, on the publication. Thank you. I'm so glad it's so busy at this time for you. And, you know, definitely your timing was perfect to arrive, you know, when a lot of us are reconsidering all, all those kind of things. So well done and good luck with it. Thank you. Yeah, we'll chat again later. Okay. Bye. Bye.